mountain, down the rushy glen, we daren't go a-hunting for fear of little men. And Icelanders do not want to upset their little people. Environmental and pro-elf activists are joining forces to protest the construction of a road they say will disturb an elf habitat. The road will run through a lava field where elves are believed to live. Maybe the most fascinating discovery is not what we will find off-world, but what we find that lies within our world. Welcome to the Soul Trap. On this episode, we discuss... It is very easy in our materialistic, empirical, modern culture to dismiss all that would be considered paranormal. It's easy because so much of what has been called paranormal is, quite frankly, unable to be documented. Everyone is always looking for empirical proof of things that by definition are non-empirical. Everyone always asks for some type of material manifestation of things that by their very inherent constitution are in fact non-material. It is comfortable for us to believe that what we see is all that there is to see. What we sense and what we feel is all that there is, because to imagine that there is something more, something that is outside of our direct or even indirect observation, means that there is something outside of our fundamental ability to control. And after all, as human beings, we love to control. We love control in the technological, industrial culture that we have so carefully crafted. It is a necessity for us. But contrary to our feelings, across the anthropological board, across time and peoples and continents and lands, there is a running thread that alongside of us, above us, in us even at some times, there is another world. And in fact, occupying that world are beings. Another group of beings alongside of us that operate most of the time in the shadows, sometimes in the woods, sometimes in the air, sometimes in the corner and the periphery of our vision. And one of these characters that have operated in that shadowy, nebulous world that we are familiar with and yet so often seek to deny are the beings that we have come to know as elves. Elves now are mostly known by uh, talking about the Lord of the Rings. And if you're older like me, they're one of your favorite characters to choose when struggling through the game of Dungeons and Dragons with your friends. Challenge your imagination to come alive and to battle with the creatures of Dungeons and Dragons. Elves have become part of our lore, part of our culture. But what if, what if, what if elves had existed in the past? More to the point, what if elves do exist? What if elves do exist? What if they do operate somewhere between ours and the next world? Somewhere between the time-space continuum that you and I are so comfortable with and the time-space continuum that you and I are so aware of on the other side. What if elves did exist? And what if there were people that believed they exist? Believed enough to have an official educating school designed to educate people in the realities of this other world? Well, in that case, we would definitely be talking about Iceland. In an article written by Brent Swanser, The Mysterious Elves of Iceland and the World's Only Elf School. That's right, you heard me right an elf school in Iceland. The article states Iceland has long been a place permeated with magic, myth, and a certain sense of otherworldly splendor and the unknown. Here, looking out over the sprawling vistas of lava fields and fords, it sometimes seems only natural that there should be some sort of magical creatures to inhabit it all. And this place certainly does not disappoint. The lore of elves 
in Icelandic meaning simply means the hidden folk. You know, I've always found that an interesting description. The hidden folk is how they refer to elves. And in fact, that term hidden folk does not just refer to elves, but it includes fairies, dwarves, mountain spirits, trolls, and gnomes. It goes deep into the lore and stretches far back into the mists of time. The mythology on elves in Iceland has its roots in the 10th century, or so we think, at a time when Norwegian Vikings were first settling these rocky remote shores. And it was long believed that humans and the elves mostly coexisted peacefully. At least they did so for many centuries. Although there are myths of epic battles between humans and elves as well, and it seems that a tumultuous relationship existed at times, for the most part, they were able to uh, cohabitate together. Iceland is a country absolutely steeped in legends of elves and other supernatural beings. Yet for many in this cold northern nation, it is more than just a myth, more than a lore, and more than stories. And the strong connection to elf lore and belief that elves are real remain a thread running through the Icelandic culture right up into the modern day. In Iceland, it is not particularly uncommon for people to come forward with sightings of elves. And in one study, it was estimated that 62% of all Icelanders believe in their existence, while a substantial portion of others have uh, had uh, their mind opened, so to say, to the possibility of the reality of the existence of elves. The belief in what are called elf stones is also deeply embedded in the culture and are an extension of this belief. Elf stones are essentially rocks that are said to serve as homes for these supernatural creatures, and it is not uncommon to see them dotting parks or in yards of homes where it is seen as taboo to move them or to disturb them anyway. Some of them are made into elf altars with candles placed around them and offerings made to the creatures. And so ingrained in the Icelandic culture is the belief in elf stones that whole construction projects, and you thought we were foolish for the spotted owl. That's right, entire construction projects are planned around them. Highways that have been built have actually taken detours around particularly well-known stones, and elf activity governs the movements of fishing vessels at times. To build through an area with an elf stone is to invite protests from locals, and projects often face delays due to a pesky stone in the way of progress. Indeed, there have been cases in which the stones were moved to cause an uproar and force an apology to the elves from the actual government of Iceland. Moving the stones is said to bring all manner of misfortune and even death, and even people who don't believe in elves will usually leave them alone just in case. In short, Iceland takes its elves very seriously, but perhaps taking it all even more seriously than most is a man we'll call Magnus. A historian by trade, Magnus has researched elves, Swanser writes, for over 30 years, interviewing more than 900 Icelanders who claim to have had encounters with the creature during that time, in some cases even becoming friends with them or entertaining them in their homes. And he is widely considered to be one of the foremost experts in Icelandic elves and their lore, Swanser writes. He also happens to run the world's first full-fledged elf school which is an offshoot of the Paranormal Foundation of Iceland. Here at the school, opened in 1991 in Iceland, Magnus gives lectures on the hidden folk and holds open forums for people who have had experiences. Now, experiences with elves vary to a great degree. We digress just a minute, but one of the things that's very fascinating is that elves and the experience of elves often runs very counter, or, or very parallel, I should say, to people that have experienced UFOs and abduction cases. Swanser goes on to write that all is done in a very casual atmosphere where 
The students drink coffee and eat cake, pancakes and waffles in a cozy rustic room among various bookshelves filled to the brim with leather-bound books and numerous trinkets, amulets, and of course, elf figurines and other elf-themed items. This might seem like just a little elf chat club, but the school actually means business and takes itself seriously with the full curriculum, certificate programs, and diplomas. In fact, there have been around 9,000 people who have come through the doors to earn certificates and diplomas on elf studies. Magnus states, people come to me with their stories and they swear to me that they're not drunk, they're not on drugs, they're not a pathological liar. I never planned to create the elf school. As more and more people inquired about my work, I just started telling everyone to come by and Fridays, we began, and it has stayed there ever since. According to Magnus, there are 13, 13, 13 different species of elves. I'm sure the number is a coincidence. There are 13 different species of elves inhabiting the cold and often forbidden wilds of Iceland, ranging from just several inches in height up to a few feet, some of them benign and friendly, while others are shy, reclusive, and some, well, some are malicious. This might raise a few eyebrows, but Magnus takes it all very seriously and in stride, and indeed does not think of himself as a folklorist, but rather a neutral scientist trying to get to the bottom of these mysteries. And he treats the subject with reverence, intelligence, and enthusiasm that, by all accounts, is absolutely infectious. For him, this is a very important area of study and is worthy of looking at it in a neutral, open-minded manner, of which he states, quote, We don't have a clue why these creatures are pulled back and forth between dimensions. Now, I think that that's a fascinating statement that he makes because it's often one that we have talked about here at the Soul Trap that those from the other side, whatever they may be, seem to be limited in their ability to operate within our dimension, almost like a diver in the sea, necessary or requiring the necessary tools and equipment or the needed time to be able to operate, but still limited. Just like a diver in the sea, you can move, but not as fast. You can breathe, but you have to have an apparatus to make that possible. You can see, but never as clear. It's fascinating that it says, we don't have a clue why these creatures are pulled back and forth between dimensions. The only thing you can do is to collect people's experiences. The only source of information is to find all possible witnesses and ask them in detail. What do they look like? What are they wearing? What is their opinion of God and eternity? Why are they here? There are many things we still don't know about elves and hidden people, he states. What we do know, we have learned from people who have had decades of friendships and encounters with them, and some have even invited them into their homes. Swanser goes on to write, stating, he also believes that Iceland is a unique, in a unique position to house elves, no pun intended. Because the non-traditional culture and background of the country has made the creatures feel safe to reveal themselves to humans. He says that these beings live in other countries as well, but are more reclusive here. Now that means that where you live, late into the wee hours of the night, that noise you hear outside, or the pitter-patter of feet across your kitchen floor, it could be more than your imagination. He states that there are beings, these beings live in other countries, but they're more recluse. And in his opinion, in many ways, Iceland's location with its swaths of uninhabited or sparsely populated vistas and the open-mindedness of the people to these beings have come together to create the perfect environment and habitat for the hidden people. I think that's also interesting that he mentions the open-mindedness of the people. When we think of tulpas, when we think of the ability of the mind to create something, is it truly that what is necessary for the spirit world to manifest itself, or at least partially necessary, is the power of the mind? Hmm. 
However, he also warns that even in Iceland, changing attitudes and increasingly uh, people turning away from beliefs and magic is slowly causing the creatures to disappear and go into hiding. He has explained this in this way, quote, in other countries with Western scientific arrogance and the denial of everything that they have not discovered themselves, they say that witnesses are subject to hallucinations. We in Iceland would be living in a totally different society if the Enlightenment had not started in the 1700s. But the Enlightenment had a terrible price. It killed faith. Now, I would argue with him that it didn't necessarily kill faith, the age of reason and enlightenment, but possibly what it did was kill our perception of the two worlds. The Bible clearly states that when it starts out, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I believe those are the two dimensions, possibly multi-dimensions, that we are dealing with, a physical and a non-physical. However many breakdowns, dimensions, worlds, universes you want to claim in the other side, in this world in which we live, there is earth, and then there is the other. Did the Renaissance, did the Age of Enlightenment actually kill faith? I don't believe that it killed faith, but I do believe that it pulled a veil, closed a door in the consensus mind of Western civilization as to the reality of the other world. Only rarely now, and in some parts still not, are we beginning to peek our head around the corner and see what lurks there beyond the shadows. Faith is one, he states, of the glues that keep civilization together. Not only did it kill faith, it killed myth and psychic ability. Many people believe in elves in Iceland because we were isolated. The Enlightenment didn't come to Iceland until 1941 when the American army landed in Iceland. Then we had the Enlightenment and it began cleaning the elves away. The article states essentially the modern world has pushed these creatures into hiding according to Magnus and his followers. Is that what is going on here? And are these real supernatural beings that are being pushed out into the fringe by the encroachment of the modern world, Swanser asks? Or is it pure legend after all? Whatever one may think, Iceland still manages to pull in plenty, a lot of accounts about elves, gnomes, and other less friendly, palatable, hidden folk. And the traditions, and at least passing belief in them, remain strong here in this far-flung northern land. Is there anything to it at all, or is this all pure myth, folklore? It seems like the best way to learn about it is to give Magnus a visit at his school. Many have. And perhaps if you're ever in Iceland, you might be able to go there and make up your own mind. I do find it interesting in a connection as I veer just a little bit away from the article that anybody that has read G.H. Pember should be aware, Earth's Earliest Age, of a very interesting story he tells about the little people. Where does this folklore, for lack of a better word, come from? Across time, across landscapes, there have been many different depictions of elves, beings, little people that have inhabited everything from kingdoms to dreams, from the misty Gothic woods to the bedrooms of unsuspecting maidens and forlorn mothers who have lost their dearest children to these secret nocturnal purveyors of darkness. Elves. A question remains. Are these elves, whatever they may be, however they may exist, are they good or are they bad? Are they kind or are they evil? Pursuing friendly, coyful play or pursuing darker, more malignant ends? One particular person writing about these states present-day movies show elves as beautiful beings, and certainly we pick that up on The Lord of the Rings. Beautiful, glorious, strong beings who help people in their time of need. However, the original ancient form of these beings was quite hostile towards humans. Often, elves would lure humans to their death. 
the article that we're reading from really begins to unmask, in a way, some of the real identity of elves. And, in fact, to expose that elves, far from being the friendly sidekick to the king and Lord of the Rings, indeed, often are vicious, violent, sexual, predatory. One could almost argue demonic. In the Arthurian legends, the wizard Merlin, and once again we find a fascinating connection here with Merlin and magic and elves, was said to have once fallen in love with an elf maiden. Again, the fascinating connection in history, that there is always human beings, sometimes male, sometimes female, being encountered with those that are distinctly not human, and merging sexually with them, intimately with them, creating a chimera, an offspring, a hybrid. It's as if woven through the history of humanity, that theme pops up over and over. As I stated, Merlin fell in love, so the rumor, so the lore says, with an elf maiden. In fact, she used her charms to lure Merlin into the forest where she tried to trap him and kill him. It was a matter of luck that Merlin struggled with his attraction for the beautiful woman and escaped with his life. Of course, there is the famous Lady of the Lake holding the infatuated Merlin trapped and reading from a book of spells. There are many different books out there. The Secret Lives of Elves and Fairies, The Truth Behind the Story, Beware of the Wandering Wireless, Songs and Shrouds, the mythical banshee and the mean knee of harbingers. The truth is, sometimes the concepts of elves and fairies are regarded as one and the same. The origin of fairies is an Anglo-Saxon mythology, and even King Arthur is at times regarded to be the son of a fairy. Fairies are said to be born of an association with flowers, and their wings are said to resemble those of butterflies or dragonflies. Very fascinating that there is another being that we know of in the Bible that is deeply connected with flies, but we digress. Elves are usually associated with trees, and again, we find that in the Bible, there is much worship and warnings of groves trees. They're associated with trees, and their origins can be traced back, some believe, to North, North, uh, Norse mythology and even further beyond. Of course, there is the famous A Midsummer Night's Dream with Puck and the fairies, the mysterious, devilish, and yet playful fairy. Fairies are usually neutral, we are told, unlike elves who have a real distaste for human beings, you have fairies that are somewhat neutral towards human. At times, they help humans, while they can also eh, kidnap human children. It's interesting, the tier system. You have fairies, and then you have the elves. Very much like what we hear people who have experienced repeated or occasional abductions. You have the greys, which are short and small in stature, and then you have the Nordic, the human-like beings. I'm sure that that is a coincidence. One particular picture, fairies and elves, a baby is being stolen by an elf, and in its place, what is left? A fairy, known as a changeling. King Arthur was believed to be part fairy, while Merlin was to be believed to be part elf. Medieval elves seem to be a mix between elves and Greek nymphs. Writer Gustavo Adolfo wrote about elves in a book called The Tale of Green Eyes. The green eyes resemble water nymphs by luring a human boy into the lake and drowning him and then using his body. Such wonderful, playful little folklore. The most ancient form of elves came from the mythology of Norsemen. In Norse mythology, elves came in pairs, light and dark elves. Light elves were appreciated and esteemed by the god Odin. Some legends say that 
The look of the elves was linked to the change of the seasons in nature. Elves were mostly immortal, but they could die if their sacred oak tree was cut. They were immortal, but they could die. Ye are as gods, but ye shall die like men. And of course, you had to leave the special tree alone. Sound connectivity to you? Light elves, as the Norsemen called them, inhabited the beautiful world. Light elves were said to be fairer than the sun. Dark elves, however, or the Dok ar far as they were pronounced, were said to be quite ugly. They lived in a world called the Niflehem. That sounds familiar as well. While dark elves were said to be evil by nature, light elves regarded humans as inferior to them. So they did not hold the human race in high esteem. In a way, light elves can be seen as a portrait of the perfect Norseman. And again, we're about to jump into some connectivity here. Light elves were seen as the perfect Norseman. Blonde hair, blue eyes, fine nose, and the close link with nature are all traits that the ancient Norsemen valued. And of course, they are also all traits that another very large warlike group in the early 20th century valued. And of course, both Nazi Germany and Norsemen all connected with Thule and the occult. Also, as a metaphor, the article goes on, dark elves could have represented the ugly Romans who had none of the beautiful traits mentioned above. Pointy ears were also a defining characteristic for elves, a characteristic which distinguished them from humans. This is explained through the fact that they were said to have very fine hearing. In present day, movies seem to show the funny image of happy Christmas elves working who help Santa by making toys for human children. Even though this image is more prominent in the present, this does not make the original depiction of elves any less true. In the past, elves were said to take away human children, to curse humans, or to drive them mad. These things happened especially when humans interfered in the lives of elves by disturbing them. The revenge or retaliation of the elves was to be feared. And then, of course, there is the companion to old Saint Nick, who was a supernatural creature, elf-like creature, who stole away naughty children called Krampus. Still, despite this relative hostility that elves were said to have toward the human race, there were also beings who were said to be neutral towards humans and towards other matters as well. This refers to those beings who were neither good nor evil, but beings who could do both good as well as evil, and beings who were at times beyond good and evil. However, this is a story for another time, beyond the concept in the dimension of good and evil. The fact of the matter is, there may be something out there. Maybe what we see in the shadow, or hear in the night, or see pitter-pattering through the woods. Maybe it is an imagination, or a small animal. Or maybe, maybe our minds have been so closed off that it is hard for us to be in touch with the other world. But the fearful thing is that it is not hard for them to be in touch with us. Elves, what are they? Are they real? Are they imaginary? Are they folklore? Are they man's way of describing demonic dimensional activity? I don't know. But I know this. I don't want to see one. <laughs> You sit on a throne of lies.